Billy Graham's Sermon, based on John 3.16. Tonight I am reading from the third chapter of John, verse 16. This is perhaps the best-known verse in all the Bible. My mother taught me this verse when I was but a little boy on the farm. And perhaps many of you also learned it when you were younger. For some of you, it may be new, but it contains the teaching of the Bible in a nutshell. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Around the world, people ask me one question. If there is a God of love, why does he allow all of the suffering that goes on in the world? Why doesn't God stop it? There is so much suffering in the world. Disease, poverty, war, hate, loneliness, boredom, and all kinds of other problems. We are told that right now 40 small wars are going on in the world. If God loves the human race, why doesn't he stop it? In my country, at least, millions of people are getting depressed. They get discouraged with life. Many end up committing suicide. But God did not intend for the world to be this way, as we see in this verse. So let's look at this verse very closely. The first phrase says, For God. It brings us right at the start of the subject of God. Does God exist? Several years ago, I was in Siberia at the famed academic city in Novosibirsk, and we met some of the leading scientists. As we talked, I thought to myself, I cannot prove the existence of God in one of their laboratories. Yes, we can come close to it from a philosophical point of view, but we cannot prove scientifically that God exists because God is a spirit and science can only deal with the physical. But almost everybody believes there is some kind of supreme being. We are born with that belief that there is something or someone beyond this life, something in control of this vast universe. Down inside, we are born with a yearning for God. We had a woman in America who was born deaf, dumb, and blind. Her name was Helen Keller. She could not see, she could not hear, she could not speak. They tried for years to communicate with her. How would you communicate with a person like that? Finally, after much struggle, they communicated with her, and she became a famous and much admired scholar and writer. When they first communicated the word God to her, she said, I knew him, but I did not know his name. Deep in her heart, she knew there is God. Recently, I read a statement from a scientific magazine which said that many of our astrophysicists are seldom atheists. Not long ago, I was in England, and while I was there, one of their most distinguished scientists said, After working for years on theories of cosmic beginnings, I have come to believe there is a God. What is God like? We may believe something exists out there, but what is God really like? The Bible tells us what God is like, because God has revealed himself to us. What is he like? First, the Bible teaches that God created the universe. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Think of all the millions and billions of stars and planets. We don't even know how many there are. God made them all. He made this earth. He made you. And because he made you, he loves you. You are important to God. If you were the only person in this whole world, Christ would have died for you. God is not only the creator of the universe, but the Bible tells us God also is a spirit. He is greater than the created world. The Bible says in John 4 verse 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God does not have a body like we do. If he had a body like yours or mine, he could not be all over the world at the same time. At this very moment, God is all over the Soviet Union, all over America, all over Latin America, all over Africa, all over the whole world at the same time. He is not bound by a body. He does not have to get on an airplane to go to another part of the world. God is a spirit. The Bible also says God never changes. Malachi 3 verse 6 says, For I am the Lord, I change not. The Bible teaches that God is from everlasting to everlasting. He is eternal. During all of the thousands of years of changing human history, God has not changed in the slightest. I cannot understand how God will always be, from everlasting to everlasting. That is beyond my poor human mind to conceive, but I believe it. Something inside my heart tells me God is infinite, and the word of God teaches it. The Bible teaches as well that God is a holy God. In Psalm 145, verse 17, it says, The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. That means that God is absolute perfection. I remember one time my mother taught me a lesson. 
She usually did her washing on Monday, and she would hang the washing out on the line to dry. One Monday, we had a snowstorm, and the snow was beautiful and white. She washed her clothes and hung them out to dry. She thought they were very white and clean, but in comparison to the snow, they were dirty. That is like our goodness compared to God's perfect holiness, she said. God is absolutely holy, and in comparison to him, all of us have sinned. We all have mortal impurities. The scripture teaches that if we are ever to get to heaven, we have to be as holy and as righteous as God. Now how will we get this holiness? How will we get this righteousness? We don't have it ourselves. You can't work for it. There's not enough money in the world to buy it. Where do you get it? I'll tell you in just a moment. The Bible also says that God is a God of judgment. In Hebrews 9, verse 27, it says, It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. There are three things you cannot escape. When I went to the university, they said there were certain courses I would have to take if I were to graduate. And there are certain things that all of us as a human race cannot escape. First, we cannot escape being born. You have been born, and you cannot be unborn. Second, we cannot escape death. You are going to die. Everybody in this room will be dead in the next hundred years. Death is total in every generation. The third thing you cannot escape is the judgment of God. Jesus said in Matthew, the twelfth chapter, in the thirty-sixth verse, Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account in the day of judgment. In Acts 17, verse 31, the Apostle Paul, speaking to the intellectuals of Athens, said, God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world. You and I will be at the judgment if we do not know Christ. The Bible says that God has two sets of books, the book of judgment and the book of life. The moment you are born, your name is written in the book of judgment, and all the sins that you commit are in that book. When you receive Christ, all of those sins are wiped out because of what Christ did for you on the cross. God cannot remember your sins anymore. Hebrews 10 verse 17 says, Their sins and iniquities I remember no more. That is a very wonderful thing God does for you. Then your name is written in the book of life. Which book is your name written in? The book of judgment or the book of life? I would not leave here tonight unless I know that my name was written in the book of life. You can know it by coming to the cross where Christ, God's only Son, died and shed his blood, and to the resurrection where he was raised from the dead. Then the Bible says God is love. God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. That is why God created man. Have you ever asked yourself, Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? What is the purpose of my life? When I die, where am I going? Have you ever asked yourselves those questions? God created man because God loves us and wants to have a personal relationship with us, and he wants us to love him in return. God placed man and woman in the Garden of Eden. It was a perfect environment. God said, We are going to build a wonderful world together. No war, no crime, no divorce, no sickness, no sorrow, no death. But something happened. God had said to a man in Genesis 2 verse 17, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Man had control of the whole world, and it was a perfect world. He had all the food he could possibly eat. There was no death. God never meant that anybody should die. But God gave man a gift, the gift of freedom of moral choice. Man could serve God if he wanted to, or man could disobey God. If he disobeyed God, he was going to suffer and die. So God tested man, and man failed the test and broke God's law. He rebelled against God, and death had to come because God had said it, and rebellion against our Creator is a terrible thing. If death had not followed, God would have been a liar. I remember when I was in school many years ago. We thought science could save us. This was before the atomic bomb. We had the idea that technology was going to save the world. So what have science and technology done? They have brought us to the edge of paradise, with all the wonderful new things that have been invented. But they also have created terrible weapons of mass destruction that have brought us to the edge of a man-made hell. And man has to make a choice. Leo Tolstoy, the great Russian writer, wrote War and Peace. He was a believer, and that book reminds us of the frightening things we can do to each other. I read the story of Dostoevsky and how the Tsarist regimes put him in prison. 
but someone gave him a New Testament when he went to prison, and he memorized large parts of it. His favorite passage was the 15th chapter of Luke, the story of the prodigal son in which Jesus tells how we foolishly run from God, and yet how God still loves us and wants to welcome us back and forgive us if we will return to him. You will find the theme of that passage of scripture all the way through Dostoevsky's novels. Yes, man has a terminal disease. It is called sin. Out of the human heart comes the problems of the world. The Apostle Paul, writing in 2 Thessalonians 2 or 7, says, For the mystery of iniquity does already work. In 1 John 3 verse 4, the Bible says, Sin is the transgression of the law. Let me tell you something. Billy Graham is a sinner. I have broken God's law. The Bible says that if we break it in one point, we are guilty of all. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So what does that mean? That means I must face judgment. I am under condemnation. How can I be saved? It seems impossible. God says I have to be as holy as he is holy, and I have no way of being holy. I am a sinner, and so are you. If you measure yourself against God's goodness, there was a great French scientist who lived in the 17th century by the name of Blaise Pascal. He invented many things that we take for granted today, like the calculator. At the age of 15, he had already astounded the world with his mathematical ability. But at the age of 31, he was very miserable in his heart in spite of his brilliance and his fame. He said to himself, There is something else that I need and want in my life. Later he wrote in his diary, I found out that I am a sinner before God. I received Jesus Christ into my life by faith. From that moment on, for the rest of his life, Pascal followed in the steps of Christ. He recognized that he was a sinner before God, and he turned to Christ for forgiveness. Christ filled the empty place in his heart. When I was still a teenager, I received Christ. Scripture says that he clothed me in a robe of righteousness because of the cross, and when God looks at me, he does not see my sins. He sees the blood of Christ, and we celebrate that blood when we take communion. When we take the fruit of the vine, or we break the bread, we are remembering that death almost 2,000 years ago. Why is that death so important? Because in that moment, God laid on Christ the sins of us all. He had never committed sin or broken God's moral law. He never deserved to die. But in those few moments on the cross, Jesus Christ did not die just physically. He died spiritually. Your sins and my sins were placed on him and caused him to feel the pangs of hell. He took the hell and the judgment I deserve on that cross, but thank God he didn't stay on that cross. He rose from the dead, and he is alive. And the scripture says that someday he is coming back to establish his eternal kingdom. I remember some years ago I was preaching in New Zealand, and I was invited to give a lecture at the university in Auckland, the capital of New Zealand. During my lecture, I mentioned the word hell. But at night, I had already gone to bed. There came a loud knock at the door. I got up and rubbed the sleep from my eyes, and I went to the door and found a student. He was very angry. He said, Tonight you talked to us, and you said there is a hell. I don't believe there is a hell or a judgment. You shouldn't talk like that to us. I said, Come in, sit down. And he did. We talked for a long time. I said, would you admit that there is a 10% chance Jesus was right and there is a hell? He scratched his head and he thought a minute and he said, Yes, I would say there is a 10% chance, but... He added, That's not much. I said, I wanted to ask you another question. Suppose you go out to the airport and you are planning to take a plane to Sydney, Australia. You have the ticket, and just as you are ready to get on the plane, they make an announcement. There is only a 10% chance the plane won't make it. Would you get on that plane? He said, No. And you tell me, I replied, that you believe there is a 10% chance there is a hell, and you are willing to take that eternal risk? He said, I suppose not. I said, then you received Christ. He said, no. Because, he said, I admit that my problem is not intellectual. My problem is moral. I'm not ready to surrender to Christ. His moral demands are too high. How tragic it is to turn our backs to God and his salvation. What did God do? How could man be saved? We live in the mountains in the southern part of America. I was walking there with my younger son one time years ago, and we stepped on an anthill. We looked down, a lot of ants had been killed, and many of them were hurt. 
their little house was destroyed. I said to my son, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could go down there and tell those ants we are sorry and we care about them and then help them rebuild their house? And he said, father, we're too big and they're too little. There's no way we could help them. The only way we could talk with them is if we somehow could become ants and live with them. I wanted to teach him a little lesson. So I said, one time God, the mighty God of heaven, looked down on this little speck of dust that we called the earth and saw that we were like those little ants crawling around. And God said, I want to help them. I want to save them. I want to help them rebuild their lives. But how could the mighty God of heaven communicate with us? You know what God did? God became a man, and that's who Jesus Christ was. Christ was the God-man who came for the purpose of showing us what God is like and dying on the cross for our sins. That is what the verse I read a few minutes ago says God did for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now what does God require of you and me? He gave his Son the most personal, costly gift he could give. But what must we do in return? What do you have to do if you are to have your name written in the book of life, and have your sins forgiven, and have eternal life? Listen carefully. First, you must repent of your sins. What does repent mean? It means to change. To change your mind, to change your way of living. It means to turn away from sin, and with God's help, to live the way God wants you to live. It means that you have become a man or a woman of love. It means that you are willing to live for Christ. The first sermon Jesus ever preached was on the theme of repentance. Peter said in Acts 3 verse 19, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. The Apostle Paul said that God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Have you repented? Has your life been changed? Do people know? Do people know it? Does your wife, does your husband, your father, your mother know? Know it by the way you live? Second, you must come by faith and trust to Christ as your Savior and Lord. You cannot understand it all with your mind, but don't let that keep you from Christ. I don't understand light or electricity, but that doesn't keep me from turning on the light switch. The Bible says by wisdom man cannot know God. Our minds are limited, and they have been affected by sin. The Bible says, without faith it is impossible to please him. John 1 verse 12 promises, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Some people say, I could never receive Christ, because I couldn't live up to what God expects of me. That is like a person saying, I could never fly on an airplane, because I don't think I have the strength to keep it in the air. Keeping the plane in the air is not the job of the passenger. It's the job of the pilot and the people that work on the plane, and the people who designed it and built it. I heard about a man who had never flown in an airplane. My father, who died about 25 years ago, never flew in an airplane. I tried to get him to, but he said, if God had meant for man to fly, he'd have given him wings. But anyways, this one man finally said, All right, I'll go up in this airplane. When the plane had landed, his son asked him, How did you like it? He said, It was all right, but I never did put my full weight on the seat. That's the way many people approach faith in Christ. When you put your faith in Christ, you make a total commitment to him. You put your full weight on him and trust him alone for your salvation. The Bible says, For the grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. What are you going to do? Are you going to open your heart to Christ? The Bible says, Now is the accepted time. Behold, Now is the day of salvation. You may be closer to God at this moment than ever before in your life. You may never be this close again. Tonight is the night to receive him and to put your whole weight on Christ. If you have a doubt about your relationship with Christ, you can make sure tonight. Some of you belong to the church or attend church, but deep in your heart you have doubts about your relationship to Christ. Whatever your background, come to him by faith and make your commitment to him now.